welcome everybody welcome I'll just wait until these other people are connected and joining in uh, and then I'll introduce ourselves and how the process will work um, now I can if you have video uh, people uh, you can turn on the video and I can see your video and uh, how it will work is essentially we can, if you want to put up your hand or you can write a, a comment in the comment section uh, asking questions. We do have questions that we're going to run through um, and we'll remind people of this as we're going along. Um, but first of all, probably best to introduce ourselves to kick this thing off. I'm Andrew Pierce. I run The Curb. Uh, and I'm joined by two of the people who have inspired me to do what I do quite a lot uh, to do this Q&A. So, um, Travis, Matt, uh, thank you for joining us all together uh, with this. Fantastic. And it's a great idea it's, for this, Travis, as well. Yeah, it's great to be here. I'm really excited by this. Well, we were all going to catch up at um, uh, the Adelaide Film Festival this year. Remember, that was the plan. And now it looks like that's probably not going to happen. So I thought that this kind of virtual panel might be a way for us to uh, a reconnect because you know we're all old mates, and, and b we can kind of ruminate on the current state of the Australian film industry, how it's been affected by the pandemic, what it's going to be like going forward, how badly we've been fucked by the Liberal government, and uh, you know all that good stuff. Uh, who better, really? Cometh the hour, cometh the men. <laughs> exactly. And uh, uh, I'm uh, Matt Eels and I'm from uh, Cinema Australia and I also run uh, the WA Made Film Festival which had its uh, inaugural event at the uh, beginning of March. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm really excited to be here. I can't wait to have a chat and really get into this because uh, there's a lot of questions that uh, people wanna, want answers to and we're here to answer them. Hi, oh, and I'm, I'm Travis Johnson. I'm from everywhere. Like, I write for everywhere. <laughs> Travis writes for Cinema Australia and The Curb from time to time. Yep. Uh, SBS, flicks.com.au, Mr. Movies, The Guardian, uh, Empire for, for quite a while, uh, Metro. <laughs> Travis is also an award-winning writer too, uh, won an award at the beginning of the year. So yeah, but... congratulations for that. Not to toot horns too much, but yeah. Um, thank you everybody for joining. We've got quite a few people here, so great to see you. Again, uh, as I mentioned, um, feel free to drop uh, comments or questions in the, the comment section. There is a Zoom group chat there, so keep an eye on that as well. Um, I know it's uh, a bit busy at times, but nonetheless. Um, so let's jump off with the first question then, um, which comes all the way from the Gold Coast. I say all the way, and it's closer to Travis than it is for Matt and I, uh, but Lucy Fisher, who is the Festival Director and CEO of Gold Coast Film Australia, sent in a question uh, for this Q&A today, and she asked, uh, she'd love to hear a discussion on the future of film festivals in Australia. Is it a case of hibernating for a year and then returning or putting limited content online? And this is a bit of a big question, so we'll try and break it down as we go along. But nonetheless, uh, what does it mean for the second tier festivals when the big guys, e.g. Sydney, are putting content online with We Are One Festival for free and accessible without any geo blocks? What's the value of the in-person festival experience and how can it be replicated? What does it mean for filmmakers and premiere status? So Matt, I'm going to throw this one to you to start off with because <laughs> you literally just ran a festival, uh, arguably the last festival in the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's your thoughts on this? Well, you know, something that I... Uh, <laughs> Something that I've always believed about Australian film festivals and that I was reminded of during the WA Made Film Festival is film festivals in Australia are so important because of the social aspect of them and the networking opportunities that they provide for people. Um, I've made some lifelong friends uh, during the film festivals uh, that I visit. Um, so I think that's, that's, uh, that's one of the main aspects of film festivals in Australia is the networking opportunities that it gives to people. Um, Andrew, you said something similar at, uh, at our film festival that, uh, that everyone was buzzing, you know, and that, that everyone wants to be together and, um, and, uh, and, and network and get to know each other. Um, uh, yeah, they're vitally important and, and I don't think they, they'll go anywhere because of that reason, because of the social reason. Um, yeah, obviously they provide huge opportunities for, for filmmakers and the films that are screened there. But um, yeah, at the end of the day, what a, what a social experience they are for everyone uh, who goes along. So they are a social experience, but also, I mean, the, the, the social aspect has disappeared. 
And yeah. as we're finding, I'm sure as we'll discuss about cinemas and, and the state of how they're reopening, how they will reopen around the world uh, with new protocols in place, limited audience members and stuff like that, social distancing measures and things like that. I think that certainly film festivals by themselves are going to be the hardest hit. You are mm. talking about film festivals that require sellout screenings to be financially viable, that require mm. a huge amount of people to attend them to be a financially successful entity and to ensure mm. that they can continue going on year in, year out. Mm. And so that I think is gonna be a really concerning thing going forward, what the future of Australian film festivals or film festivals around the world is gonna be like, I don't know. Um, and I think that it's going to take international festivals like Cannes or Venice or Toronto. They're going to be the ones that are going to set the benchmark for what's got to go forward and how things are going to happen. But with that said, I mean, we don't know what the state of uh, Cinefest Oz is going to be this year, whether it's going to go ahead or not. Uh, we don't know whether Revelation, they've said that they're, they're rescheduling to later on in the year. They're usually held around July. That's going to be rescheduled till later on in the year. Um, had they said a month for that, by the way? I, I believe it was September. Right. Um, so, yeah, which is great. And I'm looking forward to it. It's one of my favourite festivals of the year. And I, I eagerly look forward to it. Mostly because of that communicable aspect, you know, that, that community vibe that comes with it. Um, and yet that's something that's going to change completely going forward. What it means for Australian festivals, I don't know. But also on top of that, what it means for exclusive uh festival launches and things like that. I mean, you yourself, Matt, had a whole bunch of short films and feature films that this was the first time that they were screened uh, in a cinema. And that was, you know, there was some launches there which were absolutely fantastic. But what happens when you take that away? Uh, mm -hmm. It's not as prestigious if you're just launching it up online, is it? Mm -hmm. um, Travis, no, what about not. you? You're, you're kind of in the the the... the bed of where these kinds of festivals take place. Sydney Film Festival is one of the biggest film festivals uh, in the Southern Hemisphere in the world. Yeah. Um, we don't know when this pandemic is going to end. We don't know if it's going to end. We don't have a really good model of how we're going to be able to interact publicly and socially going forward once we start to, if not get back to normal, because I don't think that's a great phrase, but attain a, a new sort of sense of, of normalcy and, and equilibrium and, and something which feels sustainable and ongoing. Uh, but yeah, festivals which have to sell out to, uh, to break even are going to take it in the neck. And more broadly, uh, you know, how do you forewall an indie film and make a profit when you can only fill half a cinema or a quarter of a cinema? Uh, that's going to really affect filmmakers going forward if you're really sort of working on the fringes and making, you know, really kind of unique but niche films. And, you know, it used to be you'd be able to go out and hire a cinema and maybe fill your friend, fill it with your mates and family for a couple of sessions and boom, your, your movie's been on the big screen. I, that may not be viable anymore, which is really scary. We're going to have to start thinking about um, what cinema really means and what is essential to the theatre going experience and the festival going experience and what is not. And yeah, festivals aren't just about watching movies because you can stream fucking anything within three months of it being made these days, okay? Like we're, we're drowning in content. The value of the festival is the schmoozing. It is the, the networking, which is exactly what you guys said. It is uh, being able to meet people in a semi-formal but relaxed uh, kind of, of, of uh, atmosphere um, and, and forge bonds and relationships which maybe wouldn't exist if you weren't all getting trollied on Margaret River wine uh, at Cinefair <laughs> Fair Stars. You know? And we've seen it happen. We've seen it happen. Yeah, like, we've seen it. Measure for Measure got made because Hugo Weaving saw porno and ran up to Dane Hill at Cinefair Fair Stars and went, that movie's fucking great. We should work together sometime. So like, that's how it works. You know? um, it would break my heart to see that go away. Like I would miss that like you know, more than I'd miss a, a severed limb. Uh, but They're also a, yeah, oh, sorry. No, but I don't think there are any easy answers. I think uh, the question said about second tier or smaller festivals may be suffering because the bigger festivals are kind of able to take a hit, you know, underwrite free content online, uh, which then becomes less valuable to sort of second run festivals. I think that's, yeah, that, that, that's a bit, predatory is the wrong word, but they're sort of further up the, the food chain and, uh, and the smaller festivals are kind of not benefiting from that model, I don't think. 
Uh, so, what what is a second tier film festival in in Australia? Because we say that uh, the Sydney Film Festival is one of the big ones, but they're also one of the only film festivals that actually crowdfund to fund their festival, yeah. right? So I we're know. saying that that's a top one, but something else is is a second tier. Well, I'd, I'd probably say that Sydney, Melbourne, and Adelaide are your your primary festivals, and then everything else is sort of further down, which, which is not a, a comment on quality at all, at no. fucking all, because mm. I've had a better time at Rev than I've ever had at Sydney. Don't hate me, Sydney, but it's true. Because <laughs> um, of the free drinks, right? Uh, but yeah, you know, but you understand that festivals like, uh, you know, the smaller festivals sometimes run stuff which is already premiered um, mm. at, at, at Sydney or Melbourne or whatever. But if it's premiered online and anyone can watch it, and they have, then you know, that, that's devalued, uh, okay? Mm. That, that is a, a less valuable um, sort of artifact in the, uh, in the ecosystem. So, yeah, and yeah, there's a certain generosity to the audience of, like, doing all this free content online. That's great. And, you know, as a consumer, like, I'm here for it, man. Like, I'm, I'll, I'll watch movies all day. It's what I do. Mm. I didn't get into this for the money. Uh, <laughs> but how is it affecting the industry? How is it affecting the film community? How is it going to affect, like, all of us in this together, not just as viewers and consumers, but as screen practitioners as and commentators, critics, filmmakers, exhibitors, whatever. Uh, you know, because all this has happened really fast, man. So we're all kind of adapting on our feet and trying to sort of make our best guess as to what would be the best kind of move to make, given that we can't do all the stuff we'd normally love to do. Mm. And we may find going forward that we've made some bad choices along the way, not purposefully not with an intent to do harm but with harmful outcomes anyway so mm -hmm. so long story short i don't know but I'm <laughs> uh, um, i really feel at the moment i feel for the uh, the films and the filmmakers who uh, aren't going to have the film festivals this year as a launching pad to launch their fest uh, their films and and their names and and to build buzz um i am woman uh, uh, swimming for gold was meant to have its uh, world premiere i think at the gold coast film festival um never too late was going to have its first uh, public screening uh, smoke between trees which played at melbourne last year uh, didn't get the buzz that I feel like it deserved and it had a second opportunity here with the Gold Coast Film Festival, but that's going to miss out on that buzz. So uh, I think there was uh, 18 Australian films were set to premiere at Gold Coast and nothing, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's the smaller films and, and the, the first time filmmakers who are going to suffer the most um, in that, like, so we just had uh, Hearts and Bones go to BOD, which you know, sucks because that film deserves a big screen, but you can trot out Hugo Weaving and he can beat the bushes and do a bunch of interviews, which he did because I spoke to him and I think you did too, Matt. Yeah, and um, they also had a huge, um, a huge Q&A, uh, 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 a huge Q&A tour planned for the film as well, um, yeah, which is really was, disappointing. Um, but if you're an emerging filmmaker, you know, it was your first feature or something and you were hoping that maybe a bit of festival buzz would kind of give you a boost, well, you're not going to get that because, you know, festival fever is a thing. We do tend to get more excited about films we see at festivals because it's the atmosphere. It's just kind yeah. of, fine. you're a little more generous. You want, you want to be nice to everything and, and everything new is amazing unless it's terrible. Um, but yeah, like emerging filmmakers aren't going to benefit from that if you've made a good film and I hope everyone makes good films. I never so, want anyone so to make a bad film. What happens going forward then with those emerging filmmakers? Because in my mindset, when everything reopens, they're not only, I mean, they're already competing with the blockbuster films and your Marvels mm. and stuff like that. But then there's going to be an even bigger torrent of all that kind of stuff. There's essentially a year's worth of material, which has been held back because the cinemas have been closed. Everything's been delayed to next year. Everything from Fast and Furious to Milan to Wonder Woman and, all of well, no, this Milan, has been Milan. They're looking at maybe trotting out in in July. Milan sure. and Kenneth are going to be the the ones which kind of are, are the tip of the spear in terms of hopefully getting people back in a in a theaters. Uh, but it, whether that works is who knows how it will work. Who knows? But it's it's still they're already insurmountable things that small films and indie filmmakers have to go up against, and that's why film festivals are so important because mm -hmm. they become a place where people can see these films on a big screen. And even if they are available online, there is a uh, prestige aspect to going to a cinema and watching it with a communal group of people. And, and it's dedicated experiencing with everyone. Um, 
your, your, your festival audience is people who will show up for this, you know, it's not sort of exactly. jokes and things like, oh, if it's not end game, go fuck yourself. You yeah. know, the people who will turn up and, and go and take a punt on some weird little romantic drama set on a sheep station in 1840s Ballarat or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and sorry to uh, jump you off there, Trap, but the, no, the thing that I'm concerned about is that with all of these festivals, they are putting free content online and it's fantastic. And a lot of it isn't geo-blocked. Uh, and so, yeah, it's great to be able to sit there at your home and watch these movies in, in the safety of your own home. Uh, but you're also missing out of that communal aspect. And most importantly, which is the thing that concerns me the most about all of this going forward, is that audiences may just become accustomed to cheaper free content. And they're like, well, we had a whole year of free stuff. So why would I pay going forward? We're already, yeah. you know, I mean, piracy levels are already jumping up high. Australian uh, films are lucky there uh, in the way that uh, we, uh, you know, most of our uh, Australian films are premiered with event screenings and the yeah. Q&As and stuff like that. So we're, we're really lucky there um, as far as Australian films go. Um, can I give it, while we're talking about Australian film festivals, I think it's important for people to know that right now there's actually one happening online, which is the Breath of Fresh Air uh, film festival down in Tasmania. It launched on the 1st of May and finishes on the 17th of May. And every single one of their films in the program is now available to watch for free online. Um, so if you want to check out, so there's, I think there's only three Australian films playing, but uh, there's also a lot of other films that are there available for free. And I would actually like to talk to uh, Breath of Fresh Air after this, just to find out how it went and, you know, whether they wanted to reveal their numbers or not. That's a different story, but uh, it'll be interesting to know how it all went. I'd be curious. We just got a good comment from uh, David Vincent Smith, who said uh, one positive outcome about community, online community, and, you know, the children will lead us, right? Is that his students, his film students have started like weekly online film clubs through like Zoom or Discord or whatever he didn't specify. Um, so people still want to come together and discuss film and have that communal experience, but it's of course mm. mediated through technology because we're all stuck at home. Mm, David, uh, I'm wondering- if... on a beach in uh, Margaret River or Bussy. <laughs> <laughs> David, uh, w while we've got you here, I'm wondering uh, what your preference is now that you've had the opportunity to watch so many uh, films online during uh, isolation uh, what's your preference going forward uh, online or getting back back out there to the cinema I've unmuted you as well David if you've got a mic attached so you don't have uh, to write a message um, hello we, are you there David? you got us David Oh, my housemate is smashing Xbox behind me from David Vincent Smith. Oh, right. No worries. That's fine. I will mute you again. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Didn't see that there. But nonetheless, yeah. yeah. Drop, drop a response to Matt's question there in the comment, David, and we'll and we read that out. Um, let me type maybe chat and we'll get back to you in a bit. That's, that's perfectly right. fine. Good. Um, no worries. For the future of the festivals, I think is, uh, you know, We'll move on to the next question in a moment, but for the future of festivals, I think that <laughs> I think they'll be fine, um, and I think that they'll be okay. But there also needs to be a massive support for them when they return. There are going yeah. to be just like everything else. There is going to be collapses and and closures, um, which wouldn't have occurred uh, at any other time. Like without a pandemic, global pandemic, then certain things wouldn't have closed. Um, but we really need to make sure that uh, film festivals have the, the support, um, especially local film festivals and uh, the smaller ones. Melbourne Documentary Film Festival is one which I've not been to, but I have been fortunate enough to watch the films that have been screened there. And I always look forward to that particular festival because it's something different. I can't mm. just, you know, trundle on down and catch these small independent documentaries that inevitably don't get a release anywhere and that's what the film festival is for me a place where sometimes you can't even see anything and that's what revelation is in particular there's certain films from revelation which as far as i can tell aren't available anywhere else they screened uh and that's it and they disappeared <laughs> and um and that's what a film festival means to me at least uh and i, I think that we really need to support them uh, in whatever way possible going forward absolutely Please. i think we have uh, we are inevitably going to see several festivals go on hiatus for, I would say, two years. Like, it'll be this year because, like, no one can fucking go. And it'll be next year because no one's got any money. Uh, so we have to, yeah, you're quite right. We have to be as supportive as possible. We have to be aware that it's going to take a real active 
love and generosity to kind of make sure that our festival culture survives, if it can, depending on what shape the world is in, in 12 to 24 months. Hey, uh, considering that Lucy asked that question, I'm just curious to know if she's here at the moment. Is she, is she, has uh, she joined? I can't see her in the group, I'm sorry to see. Mm. Um, well, that was a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be able to rewatch it later. Yeah. I noticed yeah. that Jasper Silva has just joined us and he sent me a question uh, earlier today. So maybe we'll get him on mic and he can ask it now. You say that like a, a rushing to, there we go. You're, you're, you should be unmuted now, Jasper. All right. Can you all hear me then? Let's yes, go. I can hear you. <laughs> all right. Hey, so, Jasper, uh, thank you for joining, by the way. We really appreciate it. Oh, no, it was my pleasure. I would rather I hope to be anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this is uh, one of those questions that rattles around um, a little while ago. I don't know if you guys have been, I presume you did it. There was a questionnaire that went around about the Australian film industry. Um, I can't remember who it was by and I was filling it out and I realised as I was going through that uh, it was yet another one where they've gotten obsessed down the rabbit hole of Australian cinema having to represent and uh, portray Australian voices and Australianness. And I, my, my question generally is that I sort of feel that, um, uh, you know, with other countries, film industries, they tend not to get, or they don't appear to be obsessed with representing themselves. They just make their films and Bob's your uncle, the, the, their, representing themselves as a byproduct of making good films and being, you know, true to the people involved in that industry. And, you know, people in the American film industry never actually worry about whether they're representing Americans because, of course, they are the dominant, you know, culture industry. And countries who are making films in foreign, you know, non-English speaking languages don't have to worry about that either because if they don't, make films in their own language, they're not speaking to their own audience. So I have a tendency, I get, I wonder to what extent the Australian film industry gets bogged down in the issue of trying to be Australian and forgets that some of the best and most notable exports of the Australian film industry don't do that. They just go ahead and make the best damn film they can um, I've always felt that the best example of that is Mad Max. Um, you know, they went out, they make the best film they could. It is in many ways um, quintessentially Australian, but at no point does it actually try and be Australian. You know what I mean? So yeah, I like yeah, that's a really fantastic question. I'm going to mute you now, Jasper, only because, um, so I can keep order at this, but if you do have further to add on it, I'm just going to um, just stick your hand up. Uh, I can see you there. Um, I think that it's a really interesting thing and it's certainly for somebody like myself who I review a lot of Australian films, I watch a lot of Australian films, I talk about Australian films quite a lot. Um, it's a little bit incessant sometimes. Um, and there is certainly a desire to present an Australia and uh, there is a one of the common complaints is that it's all just too serious. Australian films are just too serious and they're too focused on real life and yes that's a matter of fact there are a lot of films that are very serious that do focus on real life but then equally so there are a lot of films that are comical and, and amusing and things like that um, but this is the broader question and the broader issue that faces the Australian film industry how do they break into international markets how do they appeal to international markets and what you said was right there are a lot of other countries who don't tend to push themselves onto screen, they're not concerned about how they're presented as such, uh, because for me at least, uh, as an international person, um, you know, the UK film industry or the Iranian film industry or the Thai film industry and stuff like that, they, their culture and their lifestyle is already built into the films that they're presenting. And they already have a lot of film people who go and watch UK films or Thai films or Iranian cinema. You know, the label of those particular films means that people will seek them out regardless. But that doesn't occur for Australian films. And there is an identity issue, almost an identity crisis facing Australian films at the moment. Uh, how do they present themselves? Are they, do they try and tell Australian stories? Do they try and push Australian stories? Or 
as is the case from my perspective, at least with films made in Western Australia, do they then become um, almost glorified tourism ads? Uh, you look at a few of them and there are some that, that certainly, Western Australia is a beautiful place, a uh, lovely, lovely looking place. Um, and yet the films are less about a story and more about presenting a Western Australia, which is nice. So yeah, I'm- If I see one more think, drone shot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For those who didn't hear that, that's uh, Matt was just saying, if he sees one more drone shot, which we do love drones, you know, people love these shiny tools. Um, hey, but <laughs> okay. yeah. I, um, yeah, my go theory, for it, Trev. My theory, and I do have one, is that this at least partly descends from, Brian McNamara uh, touched on this in a comment, um, but I was already thinking about it. I'm not ripping it I was off. thinking it too. That was going to be my answer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it descends from our government funding model. Uh, where it, it is almost impossible, not completely impossible, but it's very tough to make a film in Australia without some form of government funding. And to get government funding, you have to jump through a bunch of hoops. So the government thinks that they're spending money not on just whatever wild craziness some freak with a camera's dreamed up, but something which speaks to the Australian people about the Australian identity. It's about culturally enriching our society. Uh, and, you know, these assholes are always somewhat artistically conservative. So their idea of representation, their idea of, of, of Australian values, their idea of Australian narratives is, it tends to be pretty, not broad, uh, but kind of obvious. Okay. It, it kind of gar not garish, but kind of heavy handed, I would say. Um, so you wind up with stories, which, uh, and I, I'm not bagging out any movies here. Don't, don't panic, but the focus on identity and and uh, and telling Australian stories tends to be more weighted than it should be in the consideration, and then we get this kind of like, audiences get this kind of cultural cringe because like it, you know, you know what it's like to be Australian because you're fucking Australian, so you don't need like we need our stories told to us because that's how we kind of make sense of who we are, but we don't need to be beaten over the head with it, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you kind of get this weird kind of feedback loop where these films require government funding more because they can't make money because no one wants to see a film which is so heavy handed about what it's like to be fucking Australian. When, you know, but, but, but I also it's, think it's as well, though. I think one of the issues that, it, that Australian cinema is facing in Australia, at least, is that a lot of audience people, at least from what I read in comment section and, and having talked to a lot of people about this, um, while there is a group of people who us in particular who support Australian film, love Australian film and champion as much as possible, breaking it into the greater film consuming uh, group in Australia is very hard because there are a lot of people who just can't get over the fact that the last great Australian film was The Castle or something mm. like that. And there is a, there is a, a benchmark of the, that was the last one and nothing else coming after it uh, has been good. And, mm. and I, I'm just going mostly on, on uh, comment sections and things like that, but there is certainly an antagonism towards Australian films. Australians don't want to see themselves on screen. They don't want to. And it, I think that even regardless of whether uh, we're telling Australian stories or not telling Australian stories, but they're stories made in Australia, they're not interested. And I think that comes, that's a whole different problem uh, it's a whole different question uh, regarding how to get audiences interested in Australian films and stuff like that. Um, but I certainly think that reaffirming what the Australian identity is, um, is hard. What does it mean to be Australian? Uh, fuck, I don't know. <laughs> Looking around today, you know, I don't know what it means to be Australian. And so mm. therefore it becomes a very hard thing to present that on film. And maybe that's why so many people try and engage with it. Um, Matt, you run a website completely dedicated to Australian films. Um, yeah. Are we trying too hard? Are we pushing too much? Um, I don't think so. No, I love seeing uh, our voices being told on screen. Um, uh, as um, Brian mentioned before, this all comes our, our funding in Australia is completely different to everywhere else in the world, right? Uh, are there any other countries like Australia who who rely almost 100% on government funding to make their films? Well, there's the French model, which is quite interesting, where mm. uh, uh, basically a part of every ticket sold goes straight to the production fund. And it's, mm. uh, 
yeah, that that's why French cinema is so so vibrant and 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 ongoing. Like they're never mm. going to stop making movies. Bless them. Yeah, uh, it's, the best films, that, the films that I love watching are the ones that aren't funded by Screen Australia, to tell you the truth. The, the small independent ones, we mm. had a whole bunch of them last year. And yeah, they, uh, you know, the Australian voice is very heavy, but they're also universal stories. Um, I'm just trying to think of a few examples. Um, um, yeah, well, we I had know, quite a few. Yeah, I know that Hot Mess has, uh, which did very well last year from... Um, critically at least, um, that at least put Lucy Coleman on the map and she's mm. over in America. I don't know if she's still over there right now, but she's over in America, certainly having been able to get her foot in the door because of that kind of film, because there is a distinct voice. There is a distinct uh, independent voice. And, and yeah, there's an Australian twang to it, but it's very, um, it's very akin to the indie films in America. It's um, very lo-fi and all that kind of stuff. And she only made it for 3000 bucks, which is nothing. So there's no yeah, government funding great. at all. It's, 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 actually, it's good. And everyone who hasn't seen it watching this should run out and watch that movie because you'll have mm. a time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, for people who feel a similar way to Jasper, I do recommend, uh, you know, avoiding the, the uh, films that are, sorry. No, that, that's the wrong way to don't avoid films that are funded by Screen Australia, <laughs> but seek out the other films, you know, that, that don't have that kind of funding. Uh, no, see, see every Australian film, but, you know, seek out some of the smaller ones as well. They are out there too. They're everywhere. You can, you know, lots, lots of uh, video on demand services have those films, including Hot Mess, uh, which uh, Andrew just, um, just suggested. Yeah, to answer your question, Jason, you can watch it. I think it's pretty much on all, all de on demand services, uh, Apple movies and, uh, whatever they're calling that nowadays and Google and PlayStation, all that kind of stuff. You can, it's a, it is a, it was released via uh, filming present. So it's a filming presents title, which has put out a couple of um, really lo-fi independent kind of stuff and hot mess with one of them. Um, but yeah, that's the thing is that it's, I think that, I think that we're really struggling filmmakers in Australia are really struggling with how to get their films noticed and sometimes being hyper Australian or hyper um, serious or something like that will at least break through to the festival circuit internationally. Um, you know, Reflections in the Dust had, uh, you know, certainly got some international recognition at international festivals. And there was, uh, you know, an attention delivered to that kind of small film um, because it was certainly outside the norm. Um, and I think that's gotta be the hard thing is that what is an Australian film nowadays? Like I have this argument with people all the time because it comes down to funding. So you have a film like The King, which was nominated for best film at the Actor Awards last year. And The King is based on a Shakespeare play and it wasn't even made in Australia. And it's, you know, doesn't have a predominantly Australian cast. I mean, Timothy Chalamet was the lead actor in that. And, and it's yet, got Mendo, and Mendo's worth like 50 Australian film points. That's true. And, and it has, and you know- count Rogue <laughs> One is technically an Australian film. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah i mean we have that that's the thing it's like what what constitutes an australian film nowadays does I it have to be does it have to be about australia to be an australian film i think the fact that we spent so long on this topic indicates that we all have a lot of anxiety about our, our national identity and what constitutes australian art as a whole mm -hmm. Um, but you know, like you talked about, uh, well, Jasper talked about Mad Max earlier, but I wouldn't consider Fury Road an Australian film by a long fucking short, even though it's directed mm -hmm. by George Miller. Like, if that's an Australian film, then Dead Poets Society is an Australian film because it was directed by Peter Weir, but that's clearly not an Australian film. Like, get your hand mm -hmm. off. Uh, but we can't, but we've claimed Fury Road because Mad Max is our action franchise, you know, but it's not uh, a lot of uh, Fury Road's funding came from Screen Australia, though, right? That, that's how I would, uh, really? you know, but, the, but then so did so really? did a lot of the funding for Aquaman, yeah, so did a lot of the funding for Aquaman and Thor Ragnarok, you know, not not more than 50 percent. Jasper's got an additional point to the question he's stuck his hand up there go for it Jasper. Well, no i just thought it was really interesting when you look at what screen australia has put its money into over the last few years it's there's obviously a certain amount of now i don't want to i don't want to downplay the what they've done but they've they've evidently attempted to support the um technical side of australian filmmaking by putting money into productions you know that come from overseas and use australian technical ability um, now, I suppose then the, the question then runs is to what extent is there 
the difference between the Australian film industry and Australian films. Can, mm -hmm. can we have a viable industry that actually works basically as subcontractors on Hollywood and other, other um, areas? And then you get, dare I say it, trickle down effect into Australian films being made. Which but is kind of a model we have now, but that's really interesting because one of the things which has been uh, thought of, hypothesized recently in terms of like maybe getting like shoots happening again in Australia is that we might be one of the only locations on earth like us and New Zealand where major productions can, can just get up, can get mounted because, you know, we're not dying in the street like Americans or the British or the Italians. Um, sorry, all those countries, but we're winning. Uh, and, but yeah, that means that our crews will be working on, on what are effectively foreign overseas productions, but you know, our, our crews are kind of famous for being, you know, fucking great. Uh, and we've always kind of operated with that, you know, you get a, uh, a Thor Ragnarok shooting here, you get a, a Man of Steel, oh, it wasn't Man of Steel, it was uh, Superman Returns, or you get a, a Pacific Rim 2, and it means that a whole bunch of technical crew can, can feed their families for a year, and that means when some emerging filmmaker goes, oh, I really like you as a DOP, some DOP can be like, yeah, man, I'll bring my light truck and we'll, we'll work something out. Uh, yeah, I wonder how that's going to play. But then again, you have the situation where they've removed the Australian content quota recently. Paul Fletcher, what a lovely dude. I'm not going to say any more about him. Uh, so the onus is off us, uh, in terms of television at least, to even make Australian content, which means a lot of people are out of work and probably going to remain so because I'm damn sure that uh, every terrestrial network and every... Uh, uh, streaming service is going to argue that that quota not be reintroduced for as long as humanly possible, if ever. So we're kind of up in the air at the moment, it's, which seems to be my default answer for a lot of things. Like, I don't know. It's all kind of up in the air, but there are a lot of factors in play and it's very hard to measure one against the other because they're all kind of hypothetical and we're in uncharted territory. I assume on the, on probably... the same hand, um, you do have on those big films, the attachments for different fields. You know, oh. there, there are certainly a lot of attachments on major films. Alien Covenant had some great attachments on there for director attachments, as well as um, effects attachments. Apologies for the background noise, my dog is walking. Um, but yeah, there is certainly, and then you look at Thor Ragnarok as well, where yeah. Taika Waititi made that film uh, very respectful to indigenous characters and indigenous um, voices. The uh, attachments on that particular film were indigenous people learning how to do director's attachments. I think Shari Sebens was the director's yeah. attachment on that. Um, then also there were uh, stunts uh, attachments too. And then, you know, when you have a director like, um, when you have a director like uh, Taika Waititi who manages to turn the spaceship on there into you know, representation of the Aboriginal flag. It's, you know, so black, cool. red, and, <laughs> you know, black and red. And it's called the Commodore as well. Like, you have those <laughs> kinds of su subtle um, Australian elements coming through. And maybe that's where, as you were saying, Jasper, maybe that's where things will turn. A Becoming a um, contracted out kind of uh, secondary thing with tangential Australian films being made on the side. Um, yeah. It's, it's going to be a complex thing. And I'm going to lead into the next question, which comes from Jonathan Spiro, who runs the Mono Report, um, which is a review channel on YouTube, as well as he writes for The Curb as well. And he's written in asking about, uh, with significant debate on having Netflix or Google invest in Australian content and voices at the moment, what concerns or hopes do you have for the Australian identity being maintained, in theory, by these foreign giants? Um, which is a really complex thing. And it adds to what Jasper was just asking. What does it mean? What does it mean about the Australian identity? Uh, I'm going to handball this one off and mute myself for a second while I sort my dog out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's the thing. Uh, when it comes to uh, Australian content quotas on streaming, which is sort of part of what, what, what uh, Spiroff is asking, uh, there is no point putting a, a time requirement, like number of hours of Australian content required, because... Buddy, I'll give you a thousand hours of Australian content tomorrow and Netflix can stick it at the back of their algorithm and no one ever needs to watch it. It could be paint drying and they will have ticked the box and we will have no further representation there. What needs to come in for streaming? Because like with 
traditional television broadcast, you've got 24 hours in a day. And you can always say, well, three of those hours need to be Australian content or whatever the fuck it is. I've never really looked into it. But with streaming, you've basically got infinite space to fill with content. So it doesn't matter how much of that is Australian if you're not going to promote it, if you're not, not going to put it on the front of the, the, the menu, uh, push forward by the algorithm, stuff like that. It can just disappear into the ether. doesn't matter. The stand, the stand is... Oh, sorry, Travis. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so what we need is actually an investment quota where a certain amount of money or a certain percentage of production needs to go into Australian content, which will incentivize streaming and VOD services to make good content because they've had to sink money into it. It's not just making the cheapest shit possible to hit a time quota. It is about making sure they get a return on the mandated investment. Mm. That is my thought on the subject. Matt? Yeah. No, I was just going to say that uh, Stan are, are very good at uh, promoting their local content, I guess, because they're owned locally. Uh, well, but does Stan anyone know... Yeah. What's that, sorry? Stan are kicking goals. Like Bloom yeah, they're doing really, really, really good, uh, you know, with the, the true history of the Kelly gang and... Um, mm. Uh, the second last year, um, which yep. was uh, written by Stephen Lance and directed by Marion Cameron, which I recommend everyone checking out. Um, the thing with uh, streaming services is that they attract a, a younger, actually not a younger demographic, but a broader demographic. 90% uh, of the times that I go to see an Australian film, which is lucky enough to get an Australia uh, cinema release, I hate to say it, but uh, you know most of the audience is made up of of an older demographic. So if we're releasing it during this time, during isolation, if we're using this opportunity to release more of more content onto um, onto streaming services, it might be an opportunity to to, to reintroduce a, board, a broader demographic to um, to Australian films, and it might work in our favour going forward. Um, that people will be reintroduced to um, established Australian filmmaking talent and introduce the new uh, Australian filmmaking talent, which will encourage them to go to the cinema to see their next film. Um, so, you know, that, that could work in our favour if we get onto it right now. Uh, Amazon Prime seem to, seem to be picking up quite a, a bit of Australian content at the moment. I don't know if anyone else has noticed that. Um, uh, whether we get that content oh, in just Australia. Oh, Tristan Barr was cool. fantastic. Oh, good. That's great to have yeah. him on. He um, just had to log off, but he said goodbye to everyone. Oh, <laughs> um, uh, Awoken, which is an Australian film full of American accents and is set uh, in America, has just mm -hmm. been picked up by Amazon Prime. Um, you know, so there's those kind of opportunities. If we jump onto it now and if Netflix um, jump onto it now or if they're forced to jump onto it now and if Stan continue to do what they're doing, um, yeah. I think Bloom's a great uh, kind of, I mean, specifically for that kind of thing, because what it does, because of its sort of de-aging kind of conceit, which is baked into the premise of the, of the series, is you get the best of the older generation of Australian actors, like Brian Brown and Jack Weaver, and, uh, uh, Gary Sweet just turned up this season, and the best of the young generation as well. So you actually get this great kind of showcase of incredible Australian acting talent across, mm. you know, multiple generations, which I really yeah. do. Yeah, including Ryan Core. Uh, probably yeah. our best Australian actor right now. <laughs> Good old Ryan Core, man. <laughs> Brian Core's fantastic. I want to fold in another question as well, which leads into what we've already been talking about too. And this one comes from Robbie Studsaw, who uh, filmed Burning Kiss Screen at your festival, Matt, WA Made Film Festival. It's also available to watch via Filming Presents online. Um, I still haven't seen that. Robbie, send me a link. <laughs> um, it is... Pay uh, for it, you cheap bastard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only um, way I can survive is if I don't pay for films. I don't make any money doing this. <laughs> Um, the term culturally irrelevant seems to come up a lot in funding criteria. What are the th what are the thoughts on the term and the process of deciding what is and isn't culturally relevant? It seems now, like a lot of people are asking almost the same question. It is almost the same question. And it comes back to what Jasper was saying, you know, and, and it comes back to that whole identity of what Australia is. Um, what is Australian? And I think that just that kind of feeds into what you had mentioned before, Travis, about how people are very much like the conservative funding bodies and things like that. And I wonder whether how this will uh, be impacted the, the 
you know, the ways that uh, I'm trying to think of the right way of saying this, but the ways that Netflix and your Amazons and, and even Foxtel as well, which came up with Wentworth too. Um, I'm curious how they are going to uh, address this kind of thing too. Uh, how important it is it to tell these kinds of stories. Uh, is there an audience for this kind of thing? I'll tell you what I wish is that I wish we had um, an indigenous filmmaker to ask this question of, or a, a, a queer filmmaker or a, 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 like any, like, cause we're all straight and white as fuck. Right. And we're sitting around <laughs> talking about the Australian identity and how like, well, it doesn't matter. Like it's like, yeah, it, obviously it's going to be an Australian story because Australians are making it, but there are marginalized voices in Australia who benefit from a more stringent kind of cultural quota system because otherwise like mainstream culture will not necessarily reject out of hand, but tends to ignore like sort of those, those more fringe voices in favor of pretty ordinary sort of prosaic quotidian content and entertainment. So like, that's something we haven't considered. So like, I don't think I have a point there, but I, I, I just think that, we as a group discussing this may be missing out on some really crucial insights simply because of our own personal identities and how we relate to the idea of, of, of being Australian and Australia as a culture. Does that can make I, sense? Can I interject here? Is that yes, okay? Fantastic. Yes, Go for it. Yeah. 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 Hi. Um, you know, it's, it, it's um, actually because I haven't really used this before. Is there a way I can get everyone on screen? Sorry to be like the person who was this question. Is there a way I can get everyone on screen at the same time? Or is it all just... Uh, it depends on it, how it works is essentially whoever is talking will jump on the yeah, screen. Right. Yeah, right. Um, because I just know informally when I do it with friends, you can see everybody at the same time. Sure. Um, I just joined in in the bottom there. I think we were talking about diversity, right? Is that, hey, Sarah, first of all... So look at so look at this. Look at this, right? You So, you know, everybody's at the top of the game you know, incredible skill, experience and knowledge. You're all white dudes, aren't you? <laughs> sorry. This is true. Sorry. Sarah, sorry. Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, Sarah. Tell us what you oh are. yeah, sorry. Um yeah, so um Sarah Thomas, I was an entertainment writer at the Herald for a number of years and now I work for the ABC. Um I don't do um uh film or culture that that much anymore. It's also coronavirus kill me um but yeah still obviously super engaged and um i still think that one of the most brilliant tv series in recent years is Shit's creek so shoot me down <laughs> but 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 this is this is my point though um um you know like looking at this like so australian film reviewers you're all white dudes you know um I mean, this is the thing. And um, I remember at the Herald, like, um, you know, it's the kind of entertainment cultural side of stuff, always very dude heavy. And I remember one of the, who remain unnamed, um, one of the music reviewers said to me one time, I don't understand why there's not more music reviewers. And I said, well, music reviewing is a bit of a boys club. It's the thing. And he said, well, actually, I disagree. And I was just like, well, you just asked for my opinion and I just gave it, you know. So um, anyway, but look, that's that's a whole different thing. Well, but, um, I, th I think it's actually a good point. Sorry to interrupt you there, Sarah. Um, yeah, no. I, I think it's a good point. And I'm going to lead into the next question, which comes from Simone, who is somebody who writes for The Curb. Uh, she is uh, studying to, she is studying journalism and um communications and her question is what practical and personal advice would you give to aspiring writers and critics and I you know one of the main things which I found myself is that I started the curb out of nothing uh, I, I don't get paid to do what I do um, and yet I work hard to make it a website that is available for people to write for I I um, would love to be able to pay my writers I really would um, but unfortunately, the state of criticism in Australia at the moment, uh, both for film, arts, uh, music, it doesn't matter, is non-existent. There is no money in it because there's also no money for the arts as well, uh, as we know. Um, it's already uh, starting to be radically dwindling. Um, so the difficulty is nowadays is that we have a problem where criticism isn't valued in the way that it once was before. And you don't have full-time critics. You don't have, I think there is maybe a handful of full-time critics in Australia across the board. Um, 
arts, film, uh, music, all that kind of stuff. And yes, it is predominantly white men. And this is a huge issue. It's a huge, huge issue because you know what? To be frankly honest, I am sick and tired of hearing from white men. And I'm a white man myself. Like, I know what I have to say about something. I want to hear what somebody else has to say about it. And that's, that's the difficulty is that as we, as we struggle with trying to present marginalized voices in criticism, uh, women, um, people of color, queer people, all of this kind of stuff, we also want to be able to pay them for their, their voices. And there is a definite need to be paid for what you write. Cannot stress that enough. You should be paid for what you write. But the reality of the situation in Australia is that it is not entirely possible to have a sustainable living career writing and being uh, a vocal person and all this kind of stuff. And so what I did was I just started off the, 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 the you know, off my own back. And I guess the, the state of um, uh, digital life nowadays is that it's just as easy to start a website or a podcast or a newsletter or a something. Zoom discussion. Yeah, a Zoom discussion or, you know, have a Twitter thread or something like that to be successful that, that way. And I think that's, unfortunately, it doesn't mean you're going to be rolling in money, but certainly uh, breaking down the barriers of uh, being a vocal person in, in uh, for different groups, Indigenous writers, um, queer people and stuff like that. Uh, you know, it's, it, they've got to, I'm not trying to tell them what to do, but essentially stepping out and pushing for their own voice is really important. And yeah, I don't know. I just think I see that there is a problem and, and that's why certainly from my side, at least I have pushed to try and have as many diverse writers on there as possible. Uh, and it's hard. It's really hard um, because you want to make sure that these people are talking and know what they're being able to share and have an opinion and stuff like that. And it's, it's hard to break that down. Um, and as for suggestions on how to do it, just start it up. Mm. I know that sounds like the most reductive thing possible, but Matt, you started Cinema Australia just because, you know. Uh, yeah. And I want to just uh, say what something that we were talking about earlier as well is about having a day job as well. Make sure you've got a day job being paid to uh, to be able to do this kind of thing, because uh, without a day job, I wouldn't be able to do Cinema Australia at all. Um, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm 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 thankful every day that I've got a day job to be able to um, support Cinema Australia. I'm thankful and, Andrew, you have a day job because it means occasionally you can afford a payment. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Um, but I don't earn a, I don't earn a cent through Cinema Australia. I, I don't earn anything at all. I just do this because of my passion and my love for um, Australian cinema. So you know, I, I really hope that there's more people out there, um, you know, Indigenous, female, uh, whatever, who who you know follows us and does the same kind of thing. And, and another thing with uh, Travis and Andrew and and myself is that we don't look at anyone who's doing the same thing as what we're doing as a competition. We look at it, we oh, look no. at everyone else who's doing it as being a part of the same team. Um, you know, so if anyone is thinking of uh, doing something similar to what we're doing, we're always here to, uh, to help you out and support you and offer advice and, and all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. And, th and that's the thing is certainly our, our contact um, details are out there. We're all available. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, um, email and stuff like that We're more than happy to help out as much as we can uh, and certainly you know again it comes back to finance I, I would love to find a rich old man who is about to die and just be <laughs> like you my dear friend are going to help me fund uh, the future of criticism in Australia um, but alas uh, I'm not their type um, and you know I think <laughs> I think this is the, the real issue uh, going forward and I don't know how to address it other than to build up a community and build up a website and try and make it um, financially successful via advertising or Patreon and stuff like that. Um, sorry, Sarah, as well, I had muted you, but I'm going to unmute you just to see if, uh, do you, if you have anything extra to add uh, to what we've just been saying as well. Yeah. Um, Sorry so, to have muted you. It's just while we've got the three discussions going on, it's easier to just keep in control of everybody else. Yeah, no, that's fine. Hang on. Let me just, oh, the volume is a bit weird on this. Hang on one sec. Um, yeah. Um, 
um, after I finished up at the Herald and I, I felt like um, at, at early 40s, I was in early retirement and it was a joyous period. And um, one of my favourite um, labours of love was um, there's, there's a, a report called um, Shelley Lee, who works for um, Sky. And um, we started up a, a film website called The Fierce, which, you know, to be honest, like, I, I'm not a huge fan of that name because I hate that kind of thing when you talk about women. It's like, yeah, Fierce. What was it called, sorry? What was that called? The Fierce. It's still, it's still live, so you can go and check it out. And we had, like, um, we had such a great response um, from people in the industry, women. So we interviewed, like, female directors, um, producers, um, opinion pieces about things that were going on or whatever. However, as you just, you know, correctly said, we both had like sort of day jobs. So it was stuff that was done in, in our sort of, um, you know, sort of free time. And it was just, but it was a joy. It was great. But, you know, you, you reach, you run out of steam on these things, you know, because, you know, you've got, you, your whole life just keeps going on anyway um, um but it was um you know it was a good sight and we had a really great response it, you know particularly out of that initial kind of like me too surge or whatever which i kind of hate because it, it kind of compartmentalizes what should be normal um um but yeah just uh you know i i would love access to more of that kind of stuff you know sort of doing it normally and like I said we had a really great response and it was great to have this like you know voice that was female centric um but I don't know what can you do like you know we've like I said we've all got bills to pay and yeah. um you know there's only so much time where you just kind of go well actually I can't really do that story for you today because I have to earn some money <laughs> you know and, and um, that's the thing yeah sorry to interrupt you but that, no, that no. is that that is the thing it's it is a uh balancing what is going to be beneficial to you yourself and what you can afford to give the time to and for me i dedicate a lot of time to interviewing filmmakers australian filmmakers writing about australian film and stuff like that and i think that that is certainly i know what i am able to push out in a week and what mm. i'm able to do in a week and i know what i'm able to try and lift up and support as much as possible. And certainly through The Curb, one of the main reasons I set up the website is to help at least, if, if I can't help push uh, marginalized voices in uh, the critical sphere, then at least I can uh, lift up and push the voices on screen. And yeah. so there, I do interview a lot of women, I do interview a lot mm. of uh, queer filmmakers and a lot of indigenous filmmakers as well. But I want to stress as well like australia does have a lot of in the film criticism sphere at least we have a lot of great women writers debbie zoo mm. for example she uh is doing great guns i highly recommend checking out her work she writes some of the best material i've ever read and she is currently doing a fantastic job of traipsing around the world and and attending all these great international um festivals and certainly uh she was she had made her her name by going to the uh the myth Melbourne International Film Festivals, um, the critic group that they have that they run every year, uh, oh, which is cool. a really fantastic thing. And she managed to continue her success from there. And then you have um, uh, Alexand Alessandra Nicholas Heller. I can't remember if I'm pronouncing her name properly, but she is one of the finest writers in Australia. And I highly recommend checking out her work as well and then Ella Donald as well I don't know if she's written so much this year but she also does fantastic work that I like to check out as well um there are a lot of great writers out there and I think Sarah comes... Ward uh, Sarah Ward who writes Sarah Ward, her of course, Daily. Yeah. I really enjoy her her reviews yeah um she's she's fantastic as well and I think this is the thing is that just like great small films and independent films there are voices out there but we have to look for them. You have to look for them and try and elevate them as much as possible when you do find them. Because again, like I read a lot of criticism. I, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I watch a lot of YouTube stuff. And, and I like to think that I'm well tapped into this, uh, this field. And uh, I, I know how hard it is to find these kinds of voices. It's, it's not easy, but I also like to be able to, seek them out and lift them up as much as you can it's hard mm. it's really hard yeah. but it's important yeah what the, like uh one of the most um 
uh, kind of uh, affecting experiences for me this year was when I went to a film screening. Oh, remember those? Remember those <laughs> cinemas when you could go in them and stuff? Um, so um, The Invisible Man, right? So I was so expecting, you know, a very well done horror, but it turned out to be this like most amazing, affecting um relatable understandable story about sort of domestic violence and stuff and just reading all the stuff afterwards the majority of it just did you know completely missed the point you know and you've got this whole audience now i don't know what the the stats are but exactly but i do know that um you know uh, uh, uh film companies are actually tapping into the fact that there is a larger female audience um, than male possibly in some respects it, you know the mainstream cinemas and stuff like that and you've got this amazing movie that had, uh, uh, that just really just you know sort of really uh, portrayed this subject in such a clever way and and it should have been such a massive discussion point and an absolute celebration of the genius of this Australian filmmaker Mm. And I felt that that was just completely lost. It was just, it just didn't appear, you know? I don't know. I think you might be hanging out in the, the wrong corners of the internet because <laughs> in, in, in the horror community, you know, where I hang my hat, like that's what we've been talking about. Like, Lee Winnell's a fucking genius. This is a great parable for, for domestic violence mm. and, and women not being believed. And like, yeah, mm. like that, that's been like the major talking points about the right, film. But, yeah, that, but, yeah. It's just, but that's, you know, straw poll, you know, it's just what I've seen. Um, yeah, no, but but also like you know, um, the people that you're talking about in that community, you know, would not possibly be like, you know, the perpetrators or people that might be connected directly. Mm. I don't know. That's a big call, but um, yeah, I think, I think I you know. are tapping onto something there, though, mm. and there's certainly something that is an issue with uh, film as a whole because I think. For the criticism to be reflected properly off movies, there needs to be a grander representation on screen as well. There needs to be more queer voices, Indigenous actors and mm. uh, people of colour and, and things like that. And more stories directed by women and written by women and focused on women's stories. They don't have to be focused purely on women's stories like the, the films directed by women, but that does help to have that voice. Mm. And from my perspective, at least, is that the more that that happens on screen, Hopefully, the more it should happen off screen in criticism circles. And I've noticed it a lot in America. There is a real push in America for uh, widespread representation in the media of people talking about uh, film and stuff like that. There is mm. a lot of uh, uh, black women writing about movies. Uh, and, and certainly, I mean, <laughs> look at one of the, the major people who made a huge change uh, thanks to uh, the, the hashtag Oscar So White, and she was just a humble critic to start off with. April, uh, mm. April, I uh, can't remember her surname at this moment, but nonetheless, her first name is April, and April Rain, I think her name is, and she started off a hashtag that just said, you know, Oscar yeah. So White, and look at the change that's occurred there. And that in America, we look there, and there's a lot of uh, different voices who are talking about film, and I, I think that that needs to be reflected in Australia. But again, it comes back to the circular discussion that there needs to be better support for critics, better support for the arts, and better understanding and appreciation of what the arts is as a whole. Mm. Uh, better understanding and appreciation uh, from the community at large that it's that threat. There is a genuine threat facing Australian arts at the moment. You know, we yeah. all love Bluey. Uh, Bluey is absolutely fantastic, but I think people yeah. forget that Bluey is an Australian TV show, mm -hmm. you know, and, and this is something that is at stake. It's, 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 you know, there's something that could be lost here. Um, yeah, I totally agree. Like, and, and um, I, I still have like an outsider's perspective because I'm British and I moved here when I was 30. Um, uh, 14 years ago right and so Britain has a very strong cultural life in fact that's all we have because basically the weather is too crap to ever go outside of your home um, so <laughs> you know all you can do is watch tv and you know and even the commercials are amazing you know they're just these incredible works of art and Australia is not an artsy culture you know it's just isn't you know and um 
so you, you know i i think you're always going to be the underdogs you know fighting to have a voice for um the amazing things that come out of this country culturally you know um because it's just not something that is celebrated you're speaking about the country which has a major obsession with neighbors <laughs> <laughs> and which which neighbours as well is going to be yeah, one of the the <laughs> forefront of um of how film and TV is going to be filmed going forward as well. I mean, are yeah, they returning right. back to filming very soon? <laughs> neighbours have already started. Uh, they've already started filming. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, Jasper's just put up his hand and I want to let you know, guys know as well, we don't really have a time limit on this particular discussion, but um, so I am in no mad rush. Uh, my dogs will start asking me to be fed soon, but nonetheless, um, I'm happy to continue going as, as long as you need to, but maybe How another 20 minutes. How many people do we so. have in there, bud? I've got about, uh, 50, about 25 minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> so I think another 20 minutes people? or so would be fantastic. Andrew, yeah. how many people do we have in the meeting? I can't see. Uh, I've got we about 10 people here at the oh, moment. 10. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. So I'm just going to unmute Jasper because you had a question there. Oh, it was, it was actually just a, it was part question, part comment, just on the subject of, you know, like more, um, critical voices and um, whatnot, and particularly Sarah's comment about English cultural life. One of the interesting things about the uh, the time of the Rona was that brief moment for um, a couple of weeks um, where there was almost no sport on the nightly news. Yes, so I we, hear you. <laughs> we, we, had a, we had that period when... We had that period when they were all talking about whether they were going to close down or how they were going to keep going if they if they wanted to keep going. And then all the codes stopped. And then we had two weeks of, you know, like 25 minutes of actual news. It was amazing. <laughs> I don't think that Matt's got enough wine in his bottle left for, for that kind of... <laughs> he's wearing an Eagles jersey, but yeah. Exactly. And then, of course, um, in the last week and a half, um, we've had the slow ramping up of the, the the sport talk again as they start going on and on and on. Now, I don't get me wrong, I like a bit of sports ball. Um, I do understand that it is it is viewed as a major part of, of Australian cultural life and it, and sport is an element of culture. You can't deny that. But how would one try and position commentary on the arts to be as in, important um, in the same sort of breath as, as sport? I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> turn, I think we should turn to Travis Johnson on this, who currently wrote a piece on sport. He is the voice of Australian sport as well as Australian <laughs> film. Uh, he wrote a piece, a fantastic piece for Metro. And uh, for all I'm talking about um, supporting uh, criticism and stuff like that, go and buy a copy of Metro, people. It's one of the best uh, pieces of, of reading you'll do on the toilet. Um, Travis, and I don't say that, like, like, that's where I do a lot of the reading of it. It's a great read, a highly, highly great read. Travis, sports and movies. I watch almost no sport. Um, the only time I've watched a grand final in my life was uh, when Jasper invited me around to watch it with the promise of, of hot dogs and beer. And it came to a draw. And I found <laughs> now, out man. in AFL, like, yeah. you don't go on an extra time. They just play the entire fucking game again. So, like, what's the point of that? Like, that was insane. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know how you do it. Um, I love a good sports movie. I just don't give a crap about actual live sports played by human beings, um, mm. unless it's jugging. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, mm. Let's I've not forget that. Let's, let's not forget that um, horse racing has continued this entire time. Yeah. Horse racing and greyhounds have continued because the the good old Australian sport of gambling is still oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so do can we I start say betting something on about the Australian this? film industry then? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, can I just say something about uh, about Jasper's question there? Um, uh, so in Perth, uh, Channel Seven News has recently ditched uh, today tonight. And uh, the six o'clock news now currently runs for one hour. And ev every night it just infuriates me uh, how little time commercial networks actually dedicate to the art. 
I mean, uh, to the arts. I mean, every night for the last two months, we've had Basil Zemplis talk for 15 minutes about when footy is going to return. We've mm-hmm. got the date. And when they actually talk, no, they don't have the date. Um, we could be using that time. I wish, I really wish, and I know it will never happen. It's a complete fantasy and a dream, but I wish more commercial networks would dedicate more time and focus on the arts. It would go such a long way. Could you imagine if Channel 7 in Perth, during their six o'clock time slot, dedicated 10 minutes, even five minutes, to uh, Australian culture and Australian arts and and local art, like West, mm. Western Australia, whether it's the opening of a new gallery or or the celebration of a of a painter or a filmmaker, and, and not just as a one off sort of novelty piece. Like fuck, we we, we got to fill some time here. But, no, uh, a regular dedicated. regular piece. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, uh, and some have like an arts anchor. That would be great. Mm, mm. Uh, sunrise, uh, uh, sunrise, and uh, the morning show and Studio Ten like that. Yeah, they dedicate some time to talking about Australian films. But I mean, most, uh, for example, say uh, Rams is coming up, and I know for a fact that if Studio Ten was to get Michael Caton into the studio and start talking about Rams, I guarantee you 30 seconds of that time would be uh, dedicated to Rams, while the next six minutes would be dedicated to talking about the castle. Or the, the Sullivans, or something that Michael yeah. Caton did 20 years ago. Yeah. I guarantee it. 40 years and ago. It just, it, it, don't, it's... don't knock the skull Sullivans. It was. No, you know... no, I'm not knocking the <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about the Sullivans all day. But I mean, you know, in, in, in this, uh, the, yeah. I did, but isn't it, it, it interesting, though, that like some of the biggest Australian films last year, the biggest Australian film was Ride Like a Girl. Mm. And then two of the most hotly discussed films uh, and certainly watched on uh, ABC and I think it was SBS or wherever else it showed. Um, but the final quarter in the Australian dream, both of those were discussed quite a lot and yeah. they are very highly sports focused. Do we need to shift the focus of Australian films to sports? Do we need a, um, Another Dawn Fraser film, for example. I, she's the first name that came off my head, so I'm sorry about that. But yeah, do we need, <laughs> you know, do we need something like that to to get people interested again? But you well, also got, you uh, also two, have that weird culture thing where you eat that tall poppy syndrome, which is very very odd here. Like um, Australian people do not like people doing well. I find it so odd. Um, and like all the genius filmmakers you've had out of here, you know, and Seesaw Productions, you know, all the amazing things that they've done. Um, it's just something that's never celebrated massively. You know, it's just, it's just bizarre. I just, I really, um, I, can, I, I still don't understand why that is. I, I understand the Australian character um, much more, you know, you know, it's an ongoing thing. But I still don't get it. I still don't get it. I have nailed it. <laughs> it is a sports film, but Australians hate tall poppies and they don't like seeing people succeed. Three words, people. <laughs> cousins biopic. <laughs> it's like chopper on the footy field. It'll be great. It'll go gangbusters. Uh, get speaking Andy Dominic to shoot it. It'll be fucking awesome. Like we'll file off the serial numbers, so we don't have to pay cousins anything, but it'll be fine. <laughs> Um, speaking of sports films, uh, this year alone, we've got two due out. I think uh, we had Swimming for Gold, which was meant to have its uh, world premiere at Gold Coast. And um, we've also got another uh, swimming film, I just can't think of the name right now, which is produced by Blake Northfield. Andrew, do you know oh, which yeah, one I'm yeah, talking I'll, about I'll here? Recently. Um, I'm blanking on the title. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, the title's escaping me as well, but I know what you're talking about. Mm. Yeah, uh, The Lane, something to do with The Lane. Oh, God, I, I, I don't oh, want to embarrass myself. I don't want to, I don't know. Um, so, yes, yeah, so Australian sports films are being made, and I, I bet there's a lot of people out there who didn't see uh, Back of the Net last year, which was uh, an Australian soccer film. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it was, no, uh, that's why. <laughs> I, I do want to touch on something that you mentioned before, Sarah, as well. I find it very interesting that uh, you look at somebody like James Wan, for example, who directed Aquaman, and mm-hmm. That was, you know, that did over a billion dollars. And yet, where were the news articles and news pieces about Mm. an Australian director directing a massive superhero film uh, that, that, you know, went over a billion dollars? Like, there was no support for that uh, at all. Um, But then on the same hand, we still 
champion people like Chris Hemsworth a lot um, because of the advertising dollars. You know, he mm. brings in, all right, we'll send him over to Rottnest. Everybody goes over to Rottnest and gets a, a selfie with a quokker kind of thing. And that's, I don't know, it's a bit of a problem. Um, mm-hmm. we're, we're less interested in, um, we're less interested in, in the filmmaker themselves and more interested in the celebrity, which is interesting because films aren't successful nowadays because of the celebrities. People don't go and see a Chris Hemsworth film anymore. Um, I, not that they did before, but I'm using him as a name. Like they're not going to see, uh, you know, otherwise Men in Black International would have been a massive success. Oh. And um, can I throw something else into the mix here? Now this is, this will be quite controversial. But I say this with um, learned experience and respect for my, you know, adopted home. Um, Because um, it's not a particularly cultural landscape here, um, I find that um, a lot of, um, you know, like, you know, my old paper, The Herald and stuff like that, a lot of um, the... uh, the, the, the arts content, um, people, I think people, it's kind of a bit of an us and them thing with like, you know, oh yeah, I'm into the arts, I'm into the arts. But people lose their critical faculties and they like things that they think they should like, you know, but not necessarily things that are actually any good. And so that loses the wider crowd then because there's some stuff that's awesome, that's celebrated and then there's some stuff that's utter rubbish you know that people should just completely not bother with and I'm talking about things like you know a lot of like the cultural festivals they have here you have all these absurdist kind of like oh I'm going to stand in a room and point my finger at the ceiling you know about the you know humanity of men for 12 hours or something like that you know that kind of bollocks which is no good, which is bollocks. It just means nothing to no one. But, you know, then you've got the other stuff that is brilliant and amazing. But I think, you know, you, I think the Australian readership kind of loses faith because for every kind of genius that you're told that you should be into, you've got some, you know, mad twit from... Austria coming over and playing a recorder at the at the MCA for six hours for Vivid. You know, do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's hard. I think it's certainly but but it's a it's a case of um you know what does what art reaches where? Um yeah. you know every art, every single piece of art should have an audience for somebody. And I think it's it's the main thing of knowing who the audience is and and knowing where you fit in that audience as well is a hard thing to do. Um, It's a broader thing, which, you know, I think we've touched on a lot of that already. And uh, I think that we certainly talked about um, how to break into the, uh, the Australian audiences in a lot of ways. Um, Phil has, has put a comment about um, directors needed being more on camera. Do, like Taika Waititi, do they need to be more saleable? Um, do they need to or present Tarantino, themselves like, more? Or star? Well, uh, that's an interesting, interesting. Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think so, mm, man. No, I, man. It, it, I it's interesting to really hold eye contact with anyone, and I, I'll take one of his films any day of the week. Uh, it's interesting. What? Um, oh, sorry. Who was it who asked about? Uh, who mentioned that about Taika Waititi? Uh, it's Bill Jean Kane from the uh, from uh, Access Real. Access Real. Access Real. Oh, great, really, really, fantastic, really great. Uh, it's it. Uh, I saw that and I found it interesting because uh, it got me thinking of Luke Sullivan, who uh, directed um, Reflections in the Dust recently, and he tried as hard as he could to um, uh, to get his name out there and uh, and to get attention uh, with it's this. Pretty you know, online. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I appreciate that kind of stuff. But uh, the Australian uh, media, for some reason, just didn't buy it. Um, uh, mm-hmm. It just didn't get the attention, which I think he was he was hoping for. Yeah, it's amazing the mainstream media didn't react more favourably to the art house black and white film about a sad clown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It seemed like a slam dunk. And, like, where's, where's the castle money, man? Like, this could have been... Well, interesting. Really so, so when I started at the ABC last year, 
um, my first story that um, got massive page views um, and literally, oh my God, I mean, we, you know, we have such a big viewing audience, all white geriatric. Sorry, and I'm just, can I just clarify, I'm speaking for myself, not the ABC right now. It's my personal thing. But um, was the Nightingale viewing at the Sydney Film Festival and people walking out. And that story about people walking out, like everybody read it, everybody read it. Whereas if it was a standard piece about the Nighty Girl, no one would care. But, oh, um, but there is a but there is an audience for stuff, but it just needs to be uh, you know, I don't uh, and I don't I'm not, I'm not promoting scandal or a you know, a sort of clickbaity news angle or whatever, but there is an audience there for for writing about the arts, but it just mm. has to be done the right way. Mm. And so much is so stayed, you know. Like it is, it is. I th I think with that, with um, the Nightingale piece as well. Like I, I don't think the audiences were ever going to accept, like, have a, a positive reception to that film at mm. all, regardless of people walking out or not. I don't think that that is possible at all. I, I do like the film. I do. I appreciate and respect it. However, uh, it's, it is not an audience pleasing film in the same way that something like Ride Like a Girl was. Um, mm. Yeah, which is a whole, like, I, I think that is a really difficult um, discussion to get into, which I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure we have time to do that right now, which <laughs> leads me into, I guess we'll start to wrap up in a minute because um, uh, Matt's dinner is getting cold. And he's fading. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't need to go <laughs> in. No, he has to go out and kill people in the street. No, no. I've, I've, got, I've got plenty of stuff that I'd still like to discuss, actually, uh, quite a bit. And um, sorry, Andrew, keep going. No, no, that, that was, that was all, all I was just going to say is like leading into kind of final points and stuff like that. Um, you know, I think that One we should thing probably start to. On is like in the previous year, Damon Harriman killed a lot of babies. <laughs> he did, yeah, he did. He uh, was it Judy and Punch, and then um, the Nightingale. It was a it was a brutal time for sure. Yeah, two dead babies and two Charlie Mansons. What a year for Harriman. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um. um I, I, oh, sorry, Andrew. Sorry. Uh, I just want to add in a point. David Vincent Smith was at the screening, and um, of an audience of huge numbers, it was a small number of people that walked out. I found the sensationalism sensationalism of that to be grossly inaccurate and clickbaity. I spoke with the producer the next day, and she was quite upset by that. Yeah, it, it played into the publicity of the film quite well, actually, didn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but well, I, I think with The Nightingale, at least, like, if it wasn't then, it was going to be somewhere. Uh, I mean, the first half, half hour of that film is not easy to watch at mm. all. And, and, and can I just say, like, in my defence, like, that story never would have had a profile on the ABC if it wasn't for the fact that people had walked out. Um, and it was not grossly inaccurate i will defend myself with that <laughs> um but you know but it did open this discussion about this film like you know in, you know going full circle here we were talking about sort of representation of women and all this kind of stuff it's a film i don't want to watch i i actually don't want to see an accurate depiction of rape um which i believe the film succeeded in doing um it would be too confronting and um and i think good on the filmmaker for pushing those boundaries you know i should add david david's clarified he's not talking about the story more the facebook sharing should have clarified that's fine david no the problem no need to clarify <laughs> at all um i am <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Uh, what what else did you want to say, Matt? I just have to duck away for a second, and I'll be back in a second. So I'll let Matt run the the show for a moment. Well, uh, one of the questions that I had here from uh, someone who submitted a question uh, before we got started was, uh, "What do you believe can be done to limit the damage done by COVID nineteen on the film industry?" And I know I, I'm hoping I just can't quite see at the moment that we still have. Um, Jason Jones here. Jason, are you still here? I, I just can't see whether he is. I think he is. We'll, we'll wait until Andrew gets back and then I'd love to have you uh, come on just to talk a little bit about Bleedable for a moment because you were someone who was uh, currently uh, making a film or, or who was about to start making a film. 
and I'd love to hear from someone who was ready to start shooting uh, in the week that uh, the you know the entire industry was shut down. So uh, when Andrew comes back, hopefully we can get you on. Andrew, I was just uh, just saying that uh, Jason joins us here, who was about to start filming uh, Bleederville before oh, yes, uh, the, yeah. uh, the lockdowns. Yeah. Uh, so if Jason's still here, well, I'd love to get him on video and uh, just to chat about that. Yeah, just going to unmute you. Jason, you're there. G'day, how are we? Hey, hey Jason. Buddy. Great yeah. to have you with us. Hey, Jason, uh, I sent you a, a message yesterday just to send me a few paragraphs about uh, your experience uh, with Bleederville and and uh, you know what happened once uh, the lockdowns were initiated. Uh, can you tell us a bit about like you know your I think uh, going by our guest list here, your the only filmmaker with us at the moment who was ready to start shooting their movie. Can you tell us a bit about your experiences there and, and, and what happened and how that affected you? Well, we would planned on starting shooting kind of around now. We had our crowdfunding campaign uh, finish in late April and kind of the second half of that didn't go the way that we wanted to. People were really conservative about where they were putting their money and um, not really donating towards, um, you know, little independent horror films. Uh, and um, uh, so we really kind of didn't get what we wanted uh, from that. And we also planned on shooting kind of, you know, probably between about May and hopefully wrapping up by about October. And uh, so all of that has been pushed back until basically it, it's going to be safe to, to shoot again because we've got casts of maybe four or five people about per scene except for a couple of big ones plus crew and just the the idea of kind of social distancing while shooting has just been you know impossible so we're really kind of waiting until we've kind of got the okay to kind of start shooting again and uh and and kind of in a holding pattern until then uh jason i hope you don't mind me mentioning this uh, but uh something that you said to me yesterday was that um uh, motivation uh dwindled a little bit once uh, isolation kicked in and and you couldn't get out there and and shoot the film uh, how are you feeling about that now do do you, do you feel like you're ready to jump back into it uh, we are um, pretty enthusiastic about getting started shooting again. Just in the recent kind of last week or so, different kind of restrictions kind of being lifted and, and starting to talk to each other again about shooting. So um, that's really kind of positive. But yeah, in it, when we first kind of went into the lockdown, it was just like, oh, I'm going to have so much uh, time to be able to write. <laughs> and then when the days kind of came to it, it was just like, well, I could write or I could watch a movie and then another movie. <laughs> and um, and so all of those scripts, you know, kind of got put on the back burner. And, um, yeah, a, a, a lot of time has been spent not doing things creatively. Just Because uh, I, I think part of that is because we have no idea when we're going to be able to put any of those scripts and ideas into practice. So it's just sort of, again, gone into a kind of holding pattern. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jason, I, I really hope that, uh, you know, once all these uh, restrictions are lifted, that you guys can jump straight back into it and, and, and get filming. I can't wait to see this thing. Yeah, same. Oh, it's going to be nuts. <laughs> Um, I just want to uh, uh, go on from uh, Jason uh, talking there and I want to talk about uh, uh, a huge success story that's really come out of this whole thing and Travis and uh, and uh, Andrew I'm sure that you uh, maybe you know about this film but it's uh, uh, Kane uh, Gwegliami's Cooped Up. Has anyone mm -hmm. heard of this one? So Cooped Up was a, a, an Australian film that came out in 2016 and believe it or not, it was about a guy who contracted coronavirus. And uh, the doctor tells him that he's got coronavirus and he has to self-isolate for 21 days. I mean, can you believe that? Uh, anyway, so uh, uh, the Australian media got onto it. All of a sudden, he's being interviewed by Sunrise. He's being interviewed by The Morning Show and Studio 10. Uh, Studio 10 picked, uh, sorry, Channel 10 picked up the film. So you can watch it at the moment on, uh, on uh, 10 Play. And then all of a sudden, uh, the Americans got hold of it, and now it's available uh, on Crackle Plus. 
uh, and it's been picked up by Sony Pictures. So what a success story that is. Yeah, I, I reviewed that or uh, I did something on that a couple of years ago at uh, Film Inc. Mm. Um, like, like that film's been like, like that sort of came and went and now it's come again, yeah? It's just amazing, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of, it's strange how sometimes these prescient kind of stories just appear out of the past. Um, and it's great to see an Australian film getting international attention uh, for this mm. kind of thing. Um, luck of the draw. Hopefully it flows through to something else for him as well uh, in the future, uh, which is, uh, yeah, go for it. So, oh, something that I don't want to see come out of this stuff. Oh, who knows? It might be a positive, <laughs> but some, something that I, I'm, you know, I'm not, not looking forward to is, are we going to get a, a huge influx of films that are about coronavirus yes, in Australia? We are. are we going to get a lot of films stuff. about like isolation? Every, every script being written about coronavirus right now is going to <laughs> suck so fucking hard. Mm-hmm. All right, because I've heard I, I don't need to see that interpolated through the screen when I'm experiencing it on my social media every day because everyone's experiencing the same thing, and it's not the same as having like a universe, like it's a universal experience, but it's you, but but wait I'm... two years, people, wait <laughs> two fucking years, and then be able to actually put your experience into some kind of emotional, social, political, and historical context. Okay, <laughs> Jasper has a question. Um, but on the same hand, before sorry, Jasper, before we get to you, um, on the same hand, I do want to add, there are some filmmakers like Imogen McCluskey who is making, like she made a short film essentially uh, in isolation, directing two people via iPhone and getting to, them to record. I quite liked it. I thought it was an interesting idea and leads into the um, interesting notion of Quibi as well. I don't know if any of you guys have used it or not. Um, no. It's, uh, if you are interested, it's, I'm not saying this is trying to sell you on it. Uh, there's nothing that is really stellar on it. But uh, if you are interested, there is a 90, uh, 90 day trial for it. Um, so you can at least give it a shot for 90 days before. 90, you that's incredible. They're, they're expecting this to be locked up for a while, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the, I think the problem is as well is that, um, the main issue with using something like that, and it's an interesting service and the shorts on there, they're are quite good. Thank you very much for joining us, David. It's been great as well. Um, yeah, actually, David, we're definitely thinking about that, uh, getting some filmmaker guests in maybe next week. We haven't thought about when we're doing a next episode, but I think we will be doing one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we've had a great discussion here. Thank you again. Um, and certainly, uh, if you guys have got any suggestions or anything like that, you know how to reach us on social media. Um, to let us know who you would like uh, us to talk to or maybe um, try and reach out to, or uh, obviously further questions as well. Uh, Jasper, what, would, what were you going to ask? I, I was just going to make a quick aside. The moment is almost passed against... Um, Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Um, about Travis saying everyone should wait a couple of years before documenting their experiences in a, in a, in a fictionalised form. But, you know, you've got to say quite a few very excellent Blitz era films and World War II era films were actually made deep in the whole bloody thing. So, hey, hey tell you know, real is man. Open city. You know. You know. So, I, I will not hear a word against David Niven. <laughs> I'm just saying as a general rule. No cowards, why we fight. <laughs> Basically, if, you, if your movie is about, like, being relentlessly horny, and uh, stuck at home and developing a fucking weird friendship with your Uber Eats guy. Like, we <laughs> don't need to see it. Um, I don't know. I think there's something in that script. <laughs> I actually think that was an ad I saw recently as well. <laughs> I must say, through the advertising and stuff like that, it has been fairly cringeworthy, but they have been very, very quick to um, monopolize on this whole COVID-19 situation. There has been a, a wealth of ads that I've seen. I don't watch commercial TV all that much, but I have seen a fair few ads that have certainly lent into that whole, um, the current situation that we're in. You know, there was Capitalism a, never sleeps, man. Capitalism never sleeps. It so never like, sleeps. I, I've had emails, and everyone's had this, like emails from companies I ordered a pair of socks from fucking five years ago telling me that we're all in this together, man. <laughs> They haven't forgotten you, Travis. They haven't forgotten your feet. Um, <laughs> but I think like there was a there was a Toyota ad that was talking about, you know, while we're all inside at the moment, you can dream about going out into the big wide world and driving yeah, yeah, and fucking yeah. everything up. And it's yeah. like 
settle down to. Well, I imagine that quite a few uh, production companies who produce uh, Australian TV commercials are, are worrying a bit at the moment. I saw a mm -hmm. TV commercial on uh, Channel 7 last night uh, for Niche Living. And basically, it was the guy who does the niche living ads holding his phone to his face, talking to the camera. Um, and, and, and it's an effective ad, and it actually works. And my partner and I had a discussion about how effective that ad actually is. Um, so there will be a lot of production companies out there right now who are quite terrified about you know, what the future holds. I've also noticed a lot of uh, Instagram advertising at the moment when you're scrolling through your story mm. and the Instagram ad comes up. A lot of them are people who work for the company just in their house doing their everyday thing to make you think that you've stumbled across one of your friend's stories, but in fact, yeah. it's, a, it's a company who's doing it. So it's yeah, I imagine anyway, there's some, some terrified, yeah, yeah. I did and have one, one that I saw was a woman it's, on the it's toilet. It's not really um, pandemic related advertising, but I had a great bit of, of, of company interaction recently, um, completely out of the blue, completely like not expected. It was really, 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 really cool. Um, I ordered a pair of boots recently. I got myself a pair of Red Wings because I need a good pair of boots to last me like 20 years. Um, and I ordered them online and I had no idea what the company was. And then the boots arrived and I opened it and in the box there was like a bottle of like oil for the boots and a pair of thick woolen socks and a handwritten note from an old friend of mine from Perth called Chris Perucci because it's his fucking store. And he's like, hey, I don't know if you realize, but this is my store. And uh, <laughs> I, would, I would have given you mates rates, but uh, instead, here's some free stuff anyway. And here's my email and we should catch up next time because he's in Melbourne. We should catch up next time. We're both in the same place at the same time. And I was like, oh man, that's that's the best thing ever. And they're the greatest boots I've ever owned. So uh, <laughs> there was a nice bit of like, I got a handwritten letter from a dude I hadn't seen in years because I ordered some boots from a website I didn't recognize. Perfect. That sounds like a wonderful short story that can be made into a short film. Uh, with <laughs> in, yours. Isolation. in isolation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Andrew, I want to go back to something that you were talking about before about Imogen McCluskey's uh, short film. Uh, yesterday, Alex Breuer saw, uh, also released a short film that he shot entirely in isolation. So everyone involved in the film, <laughs> Jasper? Is Travis going to be reviewing it? <laughs> I, I wonder if Travis has seen it. I like Alex Proyas's films more than people would expect. And I gave Gods of Egypt a pass. It got me thinking, though, are we going to see a, a, an increase in uh, special effects films in Australia? Creed Stenders also posted something yesterday about Jamie uh, Hinton testing some new special effects uh, technology yeah. in Western Australia. Well, the technology that they use for the Mandalorian is essentially what he is, he's creating, where mm. it's, it's no different than what they used to do in, you know, for King Kong, where mm. they did the stop motion of the, the animals fighting and then they projected that on the screen and then had, you know, everybody in front of it that kind of thing so that's that's what's happening now they're just remodeling old ideas for new stuff and i hope that mm. that happens more um because certainly it'll help make things a little bit more um look better in in that's great english isn't it but it'll look better <laughs> like things a little bit more look better yeah 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 does anyone <laughs> know why uh, jamie was testing that in western australia what, what was going I on i think there? they're setting one up here fantastic mm. Amazing. Good. That's yeah. great. Yeah. But we've been playing, like, I did a piece on Sin City recently because it's like 15 years old now. And Rodriguez was using similar technology or at least techniques at, the, at that time. So, you know, the, the fight between um, Elijah Wood, you know, Frodo and Mickey Rourke, uh, neither of them were on set at the same time. And they just spliced them together, you know, like 99% of that film is green screen and just mm. essential props and, 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 set dressing for what people needed to interact with uh so i guess yeah we could probably expect um productions which are able to adopt these kind of let's face it fairly expensive technological measures being able to kind of pivot during the pandemic and and the the emerging post-corona world um yeah that wouldn't surprise me which means really that you know smaller more interesting indie films are going to take it in the fucking neck because we're more likely to get another star war than we are to get some kind of you know parlor character drama well i was just going to i'm i mean i have to look it up but um i don't 
I mean, Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow was effectively yeah. all done in 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 that sort of way, but it it was probably not a high high budget film. No, the dude who did that like started it off in his garage, and then mm. it kind of like developed and got money behind it, and then suddenly Jude Law and Angelina Jolie are in there, and and then it comes out, and then it crashes and burns, and that was just the year before Sin City. Yeah. Um, but Sin City kind of proved that that kind of like what we take for granted now, which is that, you know, like 90% of what's going on in, in like a, a tentpole blockbuster is fucking CGI, you know, Cap picking up the hammer and the shield in Endgame. It's like, you know, that that's just Chris Evans on a fucking stage in front of a green screen. Nothing in that is real. Uh, but, you know, back in 2005, it was a whole different thing. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's going to be enough budgetary um, ability for that. And I also don't know that given the, um, given how good independent films can look and how good small um, budget films can look, I don't know if audiences are going to be accepting or understanding of lesser quality effects driven films that have a great narrative or have great direction or have great acting, you know, Good night, Brian. Yes, good night. Thank you. Um, Am I the only one who thinks that special effects have gotten worse as the years have gone on? Uh, well, I rewatched the opening for Endgame last night because I was curious um, just to see, uh, just to relive that decapitation moment in a kid's film. Um, <laughs> and um, it's just, it's fascinating how little of that is real and yeah. tangible. It has no weight. It has no weight. Yeah. And I think that's the problem is that, yes, the, 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 the visual effects have gotten, they, they look stunning. You know, you look at War for the Planet of the Apes, which you genuinely think that there are apes riding on horses next to a beach. Like that's, that's a stunning visual that is really, really powerful and overwhelming. Um, but that film recognizes the weight of physics and recognizes how physics works. Whereas, you know, your Avengers films, they're made so quickly. And I think of like, I think of Black Panther and, and the, the, um, the battle rhinos in that. And there's one shot where one of them just tumbles over something else. And any other movie, there would be a huge like thump. And, mm. you know, that's a, that's a massive 500, 600 kilo animal just thumping on the ground. And it's dealt with like a fucking tumbleweed. Um, that's that's my problem is and then it, it makes it look bad it makes it look cheap and it makes it look ineffective uh and boring because there's no weight there's no uh there's no threat um there's no tangibility to it you know that's not there you know it doesn't mm. exist so why should i care i mean yeah obviously that jasper I, I was just gonna um put in a throw in an interesting question here if um you know, just to bring it back to the Australian film industry side of things, you know, for a, for a much more CGI green screen approach to be adopted in the Australian film industry as a whole, are we at a disadvantage because, you know, to, we've got a related industry, the games industry, which in Australia is not as flash and, and well developed as others. So a lot of games now, of course, have huge... Um, emphasis placed on physics and and you know that, mm. that that realism out element but we may not even have the i mean i don't know to what extent the um the technical ability exists in a you know at an adjunct you know tangential industry that could be drawn upon in a in a in a smaller australian industry in order to get those sorts of productions off the ground well we've got animal logic just fucking sitting there and those guys are world class like animal logic are like just industry leaders in terms of CGI. Um, and I'll turn up for anything they make, including the upcoming Peter Rabbit sequel, which under mm -hmm. normal circumstances, I wouldn't give half a crap about, but I'll show up for animal logic. Uh, but they did, um, you know, the Lego movies, uh, mm. Lego Batman, all that jazz. Um, so I, I don't think that's the issue that you might think it is. Yeah, uh, because like like we, we we literally have a world class computer animation house sitting in Sydney, and they are like all killer no killer. But on, on the same Megan hand as well, is a bit crap, but you know yeah. it looks great. Uh, on the same hand as well, you have a filmmaker like Robbie Studzer who you know with Burning Kiss 
that is a visually expressive film and mm. visually exciting. And there is one shot in there, which I think is probably, you know, it's going to be a shot if people even pay attention to it, which they should do. There is a shot in that film, which I think is really um, sticks in your mind quite a bit, which is a shot of a, a great white shark in the back of a, like uh, a suburban pool. And it's in the trailer. It's in the trailer. Yeah, of the film. it's in the trailer. Fantastic. And it's like, it looks like a great white shark in a suburban <laughs> pool. <laughs> It's like my 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 immediate thought was how the fuck did they get a shark in that pool? Same, <laughs> same. You know, I had no idea, and it just it just looks that great. But he spent the time and dedication in getting that done and making it look next level and brilliant. Um, mm. Which unfortunately, uh, given everybody expects something to be done super quick, you mm, know, yeah. we expect a film to be in the can and done like you wouldn't believe you know like that final line of i am iron man from endgame was like filmed you know a week or so before that particular film was um completed and sent out um mm. and so people expect everything to be done on the fly and mm. unfortunately australian filmmaking is just not at that level it, it's yeah we're not agile done. we don't have the resources to we be don't. That kind of yeah. off the cuff and off the fly Man, I wish uh, I wish we had uh, McCann and, and Pierce in the mix here. Like they'd have some interesting things to talk about in terms of uh, low budget genre and special effects filmmaking. Uh, yeah. We should get them on in a week or two. If yeah, we can. I think so. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, um, this has been a really good discussion. Yeah. I've quite liked it a bit. I'm happy to continue going, um, but we've got a small audience than we did before. Um, yeah. But I, I think that. Um, I think that's been great. Um, I do, I guess there was a couple of quick fire questions that Robbie did send through to us, um, which we can go through quickly. Um, just selecting a director and giving a short reason why. I'll start off with you, Matt. He said, James Gunn or John, Joe Dante? Oh, oh, son of a bitch. Sorry, what, what's the question? This is Who just a like quick credit? fire do question where you have Joe to pick Dante. between two directors, James Gunn or Joe Dante. Oh boy. You're really leaning into the quick fire aspect of it, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one though. It's, um, it's Dante for the howling, the burbs, gremlins and, uh, and second civil war, which if you can track it down is fucking amazing. Second civil war, make a note of that. I know, but I'm, I'm, I'm leaning more towards gun here because I think he's got some exciting things coming up going forward. But anyway, that's where I'll leave that. Right. <laughs> All right, Travis, I think we already know the answer to this one, but nonetheless, got to throw it in the pan anyway. Paul Verhoeven or John Carpenter? <laughs> oh. That's some Sophie's Choice shit. Yeah, it's cut. Look at this shirt. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, look, I fucking adore Verhoeven, and even more so since we've all begun living in one of his films. Uh, but. <laughs> Yeah, man, like, you, you got to dance with the one who brung you to the party, okay? And it's it's Carpenter every day. Like, yeah. I, and on, honestly, and there are filmmakers I think are better filmmakers out there, but if there was only one director I could watch for the rest of my life, it's Carpenter. Yeah. Uh, and the question for me was David Fincher or Paul Thomas Anderson, um, which should be hard, but it's fairly easy. It, it's Paul Thomas Anderson. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I... Go down on him any day of the week. He's a fantastic director. Um, <laughs> oh, that was a good reaction from you out there. Um, but yeah, he's, I mean, he directed my favorite film, um, which is a little bit pretentious now, but it's, I still like it a lot. Uh, of course, it's still my favorite film um, 20 years on. Uh, oh, Magnolia. Magnolia. Yeah. 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 You look like a Magnolia guy. I do actually. Yeah. Very much so. But then he continues making great movies, you know, mm -hmm. Phantom Thread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's, one of the, he's one of the best. Like, like history will remember him as a filmmaker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there will uh, be players also. If you ever get a chance, good. have a listen to uh, to. Uh, actually, Travis, you might have suggested this, but uh, Paul Thomas Anderson interviewing Tarantino about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. yeah You've great. got to listen to it. Yeah, it's, I think it's on the DGA yeah, podcast. Like a, yeah. uh, here, Fiona Apple talking about you know the best way to kick cocaine is to be stuck in Quentin Tarantino's home cinema with him and Paul Thomas Anderson <laughs> doing <laughs> yeah. lines and uh, 
and fucking <laughs> relentlessly rabbiting on about films and it's like that's what got her clean it's like that's fucking funny as shit i, I want to talk about audience responsibility here and right now there seems to be so much pressure on industry professionals and uh, people in the Australian film industry uh, to successfully recover from this. But I think that audiences also need to take some responsibility here. And if you're not going to go out there and watch Australian films and help these people succeed, then you know that, that, that's up to you. So please get out there and see some Australian movies. And uh, as we were talking about with Jason before, there's it's not just Screen Australia films that you should be out there watching, it's all of the other ones. And uh, a shameless plug here, but if you want to find out about all the other ones, go to Cinema Australia <laughs> and uh, and you'll find out. And that, that's I'm not being shameless; I'm being quite serious, you know, because He's we do not cover wrong. all of those films. So uh, yeah, check it out. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. There, there is a reason why I visit your website regularly because it's the place that I go to find out what's going on and and um, to write reviews and stuff like that and be like, that looks interesting. I want to talk to that person. So yeah. Let's make this a plug Good. thing then. So yeah, no. <laughs> go for it. Let, let's wrap it up with a plug, guys. Yeah. So thecurb.com.au, you can find my stuff there. Travis has got some writing on there as well. Um, but yeah, you can find stuff over there. I, I wrote uh, a fantastic piece about The Predator, the movie Predator the other day. Um, it's a movie. I really love that piece, man. <laughs> that was great. That put such a smile on my doll. You are so on the fucking money. That, I, thought, I thought you would like that. <laughs> oh, that was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so that's where you can find my stuff. Trav, where can people find you? Well, sailorandwhiskey.com is currently being rejigged, so don't look there. And also, I haven't updated it for fucking months because I've been busy. But I write everywhere. Um, so you can find my stuff on SBS, uh, occasionally at The Guardian, a lot of stuff on flicks.com.au, a lot of stuff on Mr. Movies. Um, I'm all over the shop, man. Oh, and every second Friday with Christina Nu on ABC Radio National from 8 p.m., AEST, I generally review four movies and TV series every fortnight. So yeah, that's good. Fantastic. And for those that are still around, um, thank you very much for joining us. And thanks Jasper as well for the great questions. Uh, it's been and you can find Jasper at, well, not yeah. even the Flying Scotsman anymore. It's fucking heartbreaking. <laughs> No, no. But I do thank you again for providing the curve. You've given me a platform to, um, to have a couple of my pieces published, which is my... Uh, gratifying because otherwise with celluloid and whiskey being revamped, they wouldn't have been anywhere. Well, <laughs> I greatly appreciate it too. I, I, I put it on a, a WordPress uh, framework and uh, I've jigged a few things and it's going to be sort of the, the, the nexus of my, my writing. So it's mainly going to be links to stuff that's published elsewhere because I need the money. Um, <laughs> but also hopefully I'll get some more content up there as well. Maybe even yeah. some whiskey reviews. That'd be good. If I can get if I can get my booze tax deductible, I'm firing them all. <laughs> oh dear. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. Um, we will do this again and stick this up yeah. in um places and stuff like that. Um, yeah. I'm yeah. gonna chuck it up on uh, the Cinema Australia YouTube channel too, if I can get a hold of this video. So if you want to rewatch it or hear it again. <laughs> yep. Definitely. Good. Cool. All right. Thank you, Thanks. guys. I'm gonna hit the end button now. Thank Bye. you. See ya. Bye.